Marshall Sagar here. Welcome back to The Realignment. Today's guest barely, actually doesn't need any introduction whatsoever. We're speaking with Andrew Yang about his new book, Forward. It came out today. You can purchase it at our bookshop, of course, but you've probably already heard about what he's saying that's controversial. He's launching a new third party, the Forward Party. He's proposing a pretty radical reform to the democratic process in the country, open party primaries, and then also ranked choice voting. Sagar, how do those three things fit together? Because that's what I think is missing from a lot of the coverage of what's happening here and really gives good context to the conversation. I think people don't seem to realize what Andrew is trying to do is use the third party as a vehicle to number one, elevate the conversation of ranked choice voting and of open primaries. But two, he's trying to focus on what he calls like, okay, what's something that can actually pragmatically fix? And look, I mean, both of us are deeply skeptical of third parties. I'm still not 100% sure that he's taking the right approach, but I don't think that you can come away from this discussion and not in the very least conclude that he is diagnosed something which is an issue. Um, and, you know, his campaign in early in 2019 I mean, obviously, I owe a lot of my success, frankly, to coverage of Andrew Yang. And I still believe he tapped into something which he's going after this time around. It feels more authentic to his brand, Marshall. Yeah, this is definitely an episode to those of you who are watching on YouTube and those of you who are listening on the podcast, we want people to write in about because I'm sure everyone's going to have a bunch of different reactions. I personally think third parties are cringe and cope at the same time. But the key thing, and once again, why Andrew's discussion is worth it, is that he's focused on incentives. He thinks when you go to Congress, the reason why you don't get anything done is because of A, the lack of an open party primary, aka most people in the country who don't see themselves as a part of the two-party system feel disadvantaged. Therefore, their votes don't matter. Their perspectives don't matter. So whether or not I like a third party or not, it's really important to have a conversation about that, especially given the fact that places like New York City and states like Alaska have actually advanced the reforms he's talking about. So think yeah. about this conversation on two levels. Level one is third party, yay or nay. But level two is even if you don't like a third party, should there or shouldn't there be an open primary system and ranked choice voting? 100%. Really well said. As always, a special thank you to the Lincoln Network for sponsoring this podcast. Let's get to it. And quick thing, because this is going on YouTube because we were tight for time, that is Lincoln Net work, not Lincoln Project. This is something you YouTube viewers do not often see. We're being very frank here. And a quick note, as we asked for responses, we put out a Substack on Thursday. So you could follow the link to the Substack there, where you could also purchase a copy of Andrew's book. We want to hear what you think about everything we covered this episode, especially if you're a new listener, new viewer. Let's get into it. Andrew Yang, welcome to The Realignment. Sagar, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Good to see you, man. I'm really glad you could do uh, you could do this. You know, it's interesting. Marshall and I, we got the book, the advanced copy. There obviously was a lot of consternation around the announcement. But having you know known you and covered you now for a long time, I think what I wanted to start out was this. What experience from the Democratic Party in the primary for the president in the 2020 race and in the New York mayoral race, what experiences, what reflections did you have that led you to conclude we need a new third party and write this book? Like, describe to us how you got to where you are in that process. I'd be happy to, and uh, grateful to to you for being one of the media figures who covered the me in the presidential uh, when you know we were being ignored <laughs> by a lot of other people. Um, so I came off the trail in February of 2020, and I set to writing, uh, in part because I wanted to document experiences that I had had zero time to reflect on. Uh, because you imagine running for president in the heart of the campaign, uh, it's just go, go, go all the time. And so it was while I was writing this book last year that I came to grips with what I thought was wrong, which is that we, we have a system of incentives that make it so that even very noble, well-intended people will get there and not really either be able to deliver uh, or over time have any vision they, they, they might have had watered down. <laughs> and so, uh, and I didn't come up with this all on my own. I mean, as you've read the book, you know that uh, I've been influenced by Jonathan Haidt and 
Ezra Klein and Catherine Gale and Lawrence Lessig and Michael Porter and these other thinkers. Uh, but I, I came to realize that the system I- itself is the problem and that there was no real way that even a great person from either party who got in there was somehow going to make fundamental changes. And then when you arrive at that conclusion, then you think, okay, well, how could you make real changes? Uh, And I believe the biggest mechanism we have to change is the closed party primaries, that if we change to open primaries and ranked choice voting, that uh, you'd have very, very different incentives and different points of view. Uh, So I arrived at this conclusion, and one of the things I feel like I owe people is to say what I really think the answer is, And then I don't have it in me to say, hey, someone should do this and then just go on with my my life. I mean, that's not how I'm wired. Um, I don't see myself as a writer or thinker so much as a builder, operator, doer. And so if I say, look, here's the problem, here's the solution, then I'd better bust my ass trying to provide the solution. And and, uh, that's how the forward party uh, was originated. Hmm. It's funny. I want to tell a quick media story that has the two of us tangentially connected because it speaks to the media space when you first enter the race, which I actually really appreciated that chapter in the book. So I was a researcher at a new show called Firing Line on PBS. So this is in early, this is in May, June 2018. And one of our producers says, Hey, like we met this, this guy at a, birthday party. He had this book about UBI. Should we book this person? And the answer was obviously no, because we didn't know who you were. So there's just this really funny intersection of Sagar was in the you know non-mainstream media space. I was in the mainstream media PBS space. And there was just something that was missing at an undercurrent there, which I just have always wanted to just mention to you. I thought was funny. Obviously, if we'd booked you, it would have been very good for the show itself. And that was a huge mess on our end. But I want to go to something you just said, which is really identifying the dysfunction and the real hopelessness that people feel in the political system right now. Because I think, look, I'll just be open. I'm skeptical of third parties. But what I've noticed from a lot of commentators in the mainstream who've poo-pooed the idea is they have not understood the way people actually feel about this topic. As in, people genuinely feel as if the system is corrupt and doesn't function. However, to give you some historical context, you know, we've been through periods like this before, post-Civil War, industrial era, when we're trying to reckon of all these big changes. It's been easy to say that things couldn't change, but eventually they did without these big structural changes. What makes right now in this moment unique and different from those prior periods where we could have a lot of the same feelings? Marshall, I, I think if you do rewind the tape, uh, you would find that we're actually in the midst of an accidental duopoly. I mean, like in the sense that the founding fathers didn't come together and say, you know what, we need two parties <laughs> that, that, that will be warring with each other uh, and uh, at some point turning us into a polarized nation on the brink of political violence and civil war. I mean, that, that that's no one's plan. Um, and so what the way you frame that question is, uh, is that uh, there have been these other episodes in history where people have thought we needed something different and then the duopoly has uh, continued. But if you rewind further, you have founders who are very, very anti-factionalism and anti-partisan. And if they saw this duopoly, they would be shocked and horrified and think this is literally the worst design <laughs> that anyone uh, could come up with. So y- you have an environment where... Political stress is at all-time highs. You have 62% of Americans, also an all-time high, calling for a third party. You have people who are touching the political system, like you and Sagar and other you know, dozens of other people we know, who are throwing their hands up privately or publicly saying, wow, like this really is a dysfunctional mess. You know, that like this thing's not gonna somehow uh, right itself. And then you still have this sense, but it can't change. Uh, And in my mind, there is a question as to how things go in our country. Things are not going well. And so if you say, look, we're going to ride this duopoly, we're going to ride it to ruin. And I think a lot of people sense that and agree with that. And then when someone raises their hand and says, maybe we should change it then. (laughs) By the way, tens of millions of Americans agree with that. Uh, then everyone's like, oh, no, no, like can't can't change it. I mean, arguing for the status quo at a certain point is a real losing argument 
particularly at a time when millions of Americans are looking around for some kind of change, alternative, restructuring. It's happening in every other industry except for politics because we're being told that it can't change. Yeah, I mean, it's it's fascinating because I compl- I understand exactly that impulse. I, let's talk about the mechanic, though, like ranked choice voting. Um, I wouldn't say, you know, New York, it was kind of a, let's say, didn't go so well, at least in terms of how it appeared. That being said, the New York Board of Elections has always been kind of a hot mess. What are your reflections on the actual implementation of ranked choice voting that you yourself had to participate in? And what are the promises from within the book that led you to really believe that this this thing alone could fix so many of our problems? Why? Well, first, you have to differentiate between the ability of the New York BOE to execute (laughs) (laughs) Um, uh, and the process itself. Uh, 95% of New Yorkers found ranked choice voting easy to use. 77% want to do it again. And if you can get four out of five New Yorkers to agree on something, I'd say that's pretty damn good. Uh, And you also have to differentiate between ranked choice voting within a party primary, which was the case in New York City, and ranked choice voting in an open primary, which is, uh, in my mind, a much more dramatic improvement. So even in the mayoral race, uh, people were saying, oh, turnout went up from, you know, let's call it 800,000 to 900,000 votes, uh, which still means only about 11% of New Yorkers voted in that primary. And the next mayor might get 5% or something along, along those lines. So these are not numbers that you should be pumped about. <laughs> but, but that's a function of the closed party primary system more than ranked choice voting. So ranked choice voting does something really, really powerful. And I'm just going to reference some of the objections that people have uh, leveled at any whisper of Andrew Yang starting a third party is like, oh, you're going to ruin it for X. And uh, and part of that is like, well, well, sure, if you have this archaic plurality voting system, um, you get to bludgeon anyone who comes up because they're going to ruin it for someone, theoretically, even though that makes a bunch of leaps and assumptions that probably aren't true in the rest of it. But if you make a change to ranked choice voting, then all of a sudden there's no spoiler effect. You can vote for the minor third party candidate first, and then let's say hypothetically the Democrat second, and then no one can accuse you of ruining anything. (laughs) Um, Mm -hmm. You have different coalitions that come together. You have to appeal to a majority. Uh, It doesn't reward the extremes like our current system does. And right now the biggest problem, and I want folks who are listening to this uh, uh, to, to understand why things seem so broken in our system, Congress has a national approval rating of 28%. The re-election rate for individual members is 92%. Think about that system for a second. And the reason why those numbers are so different is that the average legislator does not have to appeal to 51% of people in their district to get re-elected. They just have to appeal to the most partisan 12 to 17%, really. And so if you think that legislators don't seem very reasonable or common sense, it's because their incentives are not to be very reasonable or common sense. So if you were to change that to ranked choice voting open primary, all of a sudden it's like, oh, wait, I can't just, uh, you know, frankly, placate the 20 percent most extreme people in my district. I actually have to appeal to 51 percent of you. You would see everyone's behavior change. You'd see arguments change. And ranked choice voting theoretically would make negative campaigning uh less popular because if you trash someone, then they look bad, you look bad, and then the third person who's not trashing anyone looks better by comparison. You know, we've had Catherine Gao on the show before, so Rui suggests that listeners take a look at that episode from last June to get really deep into the ideas we're talking about here. I'm curious when it comes to the open primary debate, what lessons do you take from California's experience? Because typically, you know, California is a state that has experimented with making these changes for over almost 10 years now. And it's hard to say that California reflects the dynamics you're talking about. So the state is still hyperpolarized between urban and rural. There's still a very specific political class of folks who tend to keep on the up and up no matter what. The Republican Party has not become any more competitive than it was before. Actually, if anything, it's become less competitive. What are the lessons from the California experience that as you're looking to make that model more national, reformers like you should take into account? The biggest 
deficit in my view of the California change is that it's top two, uh, where I think that Catherine Gale's on the right track that if you had top five ranked choice voting, then you'd have much more diverse points of view in every district. Uh, right now, it's an improvement because it's open primary and anyone can run. But in real life, what that generally means is that like the, <laughs> the, 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 like the top two candidates will be the Democrat and the Republican in most instances, maybe every once in a while a Democrat versus a Democrat. Um, and, and you're not really giving rise to a whole lot of dynamism. Uh, that said, Californians satisfaction with the state legislature did go up in the wake of this. And there was an increased level of competitiveness um, and activity on the part of some legislators who actually felt like they had to attend to their constituents and uh, maybe campaign a bit more. <laughs> so so, uh, so there, there have been some good things uh, with the change, but in my mind, uh, the top two uh, doesn't do it justice. Uh, you would want to have more candidates make it to the general. It, you know, Andrew, one of the things I hear most skeptical, I would say my friends who are much more like MAGA right than me, they have a pretty articulate defense of the of the polarized primary system because they're like, no, actually, some questions are irreconcilable. It's actually a good thing I'm, in order to hold our legislators to a very, very high standard of what you know our base of our party wants and make it so that they fight for that whenever they come to Washington and make it so that, you know, eventually this subscribes more to the theory that you have to have a knockout punch on certain issues, things like guns, abortion, which generally are like literally two sided. What would a rank choice voting system fix about that? So first of all, tell us why that system is bad. Um, you know, what is the defense of the more centrist or at least solutions compromise based strategy in the face of some genuinely irreconcilable questions, but B, what would the world look like differently in terms of hashing out a solution in a, in a congressional setting? I think that that argument speaks for itself in some ways, which is look, uh, if, if you want a strident minority of people to have outsized influence, um, then our current system probably serves you pretty well. <laughs> you right. know what I mean? Um, and, and that's not just on the right. Uh, you know, there are special interests that have a real chokehold on Democratic uh, Party primaries that have outsized influence. I'm going to call out teachers unions as one example. Um, uh, and so our policy reflects that. Uh, if, if, like most Americans, you think that there are uh, is a desire to try and forge middle ground on some of these problems. I mean, when I talked to gun owners, as an example, when I was running for president, uh, I thought there was common ground to be had. Uh, you know, the most common cause of, of gun deaths is suicide, where, or not the version of, of gun deaths, I should say. Yes. Um, and, and so you have the, these problems that affect everybody. Um, and there are things that I think you can agree on that would uh, make people safer while in that case uh, safeguarding constitutional rights. So you wouldn't see, in my mind, uh, as binary an approach. Um, and I, I think that's what a lot of Americans are looking for right now is to, to try and find the grounds for agreement. There is a really important tension to what you're describing. In a good way, because this is ambitious and anything ambitious that's not just tinkering is going to have tensions. You're talking about agreement, consensus, middle. But at the start of the episode, you spoke about fundamental changes. And I could easily imagine the conversation you just had about gun control as impacting both ends demanding fundamental change to be kind of ticked off. So if I'm thinking your center left to left person, you'd say, Actually, Andrew, good on the suicide stuff. We should work on that, obviously. But at a fundamental level, I think that America has too many guns. We should look more like Australia. We should look more like Europe. And everything that doesn't reflect that is just tinkering on the edges. And then if you're on the right, you would basically say that all of that is, you know, uh, you know, paving the way to hell with good intentions, which is that ultimately speaking, the center left to left just wants to remove guns. So we're just not going to go negotiate there. So how do you just navigate the fact that on the one hand, you want fundamental changes, but it's hard to see consensus-based policy and politics as building fundamental changes, given what the audience is actually saying about that? 
Well, I want fundamental changes to a broken system. <laughs> you know, I'm not saying I want to make changes necessarily in, in, in each of these issues. Uh, I think uh, this to me is what's necessary in American life, where if you talk to a group of people uh, on either side, uh, you know, that that most of us want there to be some progress on some of these issues or compromise. But right, right now, the incentives make it so that you can become more politically prominent and raise more money and sometimes get more votes if you just articulate points of view on the extreme. And by the way, that is leading us to Civil War 2.0. I mean, it is. You know, like, if you look at it, it's not just that Peter Turchin's political stress index is at Civil War levels or that you are seeing violence in the streets manifest in different ways or that our political conversation is becoming more and more adversarial, where 42% of Democrats and Republicans think the other side is evil uh, and it's ruining families and holidays and everything else. Like, we're, we're, we're trapped in a, a dynamic that we need to get out of. Uh, and right now, the political incentives drive us to the extremes, the media incentives drive us to the extremes, the social media incentives drive us, drive us to the extremes. Where does this go? Where does this end? One of the things I've been saying is I want to be America's wet blanket. I want to just take a wet blanket and be like, Psh, like everyone, it's going to be all right. We're still human beings and Americans. Uh, let's let's get a system that breaks us out of this doom loop. Uh, and then we'll be able to, to come together and at least have a process that people feel like they're represented in, even if they're not represented by one of the two extremes right now. Yeah, I mean, look, I mean, I've spent much of my career trying to do the same thing. And while there is a sizable audience that wants that, there's an even more sizable audience that votes in primaries and move things in that direction. So I'm curious, you know, from a third party perspective, I'm sure you're, you're going to get this answer in a million or a question in a million different iterations, but it is important, which is why is a third party the answer? I have a poster on the Breaking Point set of William Jennings Bryan, somebody I deeply respect, who essentially was a third party candidate, but who transformed and took over the Democratic Party in the 1890s. Um, Donald Trump, in many ways, the most transformative political figure of my lifetime, had no connection with the institutional GOP, but effectively took it over from the outside and remade it in his own image. Why not, Andrew? You are famous. You've run in the presidential primary. You had the proven ability to raise tens of millions of dollars in the Democratic Party, more so than many establishment figures. Why not leverage your part of that Democratic Party and try and take it over from within? Why is this the answer you have to go with? Sagar, I think that your importance in the media landscape can't be understated. You too, Marshall, Crystal. Uh, when, when you say like, hey, there's a sizable audience for this, um, I think there is a massive audience and it heartens me that that audience continues to grow uh, because a lot of folks say to me in normal life, be like, hey, I don't even know where to go for news anymore. Um, and, and some, you know, and some of them have found you uh, and uh, um, other independent voices. And, and I think that's so necessary. I think if we can continue to grow that point of view, then it can become more of a political force. Um now, uh, I, I think that you've actually articulated in some ways a dynamic that would strengthen the need to have more political dynamism in, in multiple parties. So Donald Trump has taken over the Republican Party. Um, I know and you know that there are many people who have different points of view than Donald Trump within the party, but don't breathe a word because if they do, they will be cast out uh, and um, their political careers will be ended. Um, and why is that? It's because we have this two-party system and, uh, you know, party primaries control so much and that if you say a bad word about Trump, uh, you're out. I'm going to suggest that's not excellent for democracy yeah. generally. Um, and then you have the Democratic Party and you say, hey, Andrew, why don't you just take over the Democratic Party, Trump style? So right now, the big difference between Democrats and Republicans is that Democrats are institutionalists and Republicans are not. I cannot tell you how many independents and Republicans came up to me and be like, hey, man, love you. Like, you know, like way, way to like go against, uh, you know, the uh, entrenched machine and the rest of it. Um, but within the Democratic Party, uh, they really believe in bureaucracies and machines and processes to a much, much higher degree. And here's a stat that I think illustrates the difference between the parties. 
69% of Democrats say they have a high trust in media by media, you, you know, generally the corporate media. Right. Independents, 36%. Republicans, 15%. So Republicans don't believe it at all, and just they think that oh, like the, the you know the institutions are are uh, corrupt now to get us. The Democrats are the people who believe in it and are just like oh yeah, like you know that things are going all right, and like just let the you know people who've been doing it for a while keep doing it. Um, so you have very very different dynamics, uh, and it, it's going to influence who winds up emerging from uh, each side. Something I'm wondering is. What do independents actually believe? Because I love the 62% Gallup poll looking for a third party. We'll put it up in the show notes. But if you actually look into the data, it gets a little interesting, given the fact that, for example, a decent number of those independents are former Republicans who actually want the Republican Party to become more Trumpy, not less. Another interesting thing that came to mind when you're talking about how you get drummed out of the Republican Party if you don't vote for Trump is the fact that Liz Cheney actually voted with Trump more than Elise Stefanik did. So there's a certain weird mix of personalities and coalitions and dynamics. But I guess what I kind of wonder is if we're actually looking at the country and the results of the politics that we're engaging in, considering the fact that Liz Cheney actually does, once again, vote pretty conservative aside from the Trump thing, how is giving her her own tiny coalition party that would end up still working with the Republican Party on most questions? Once again, she votes with Trump most of the time, far more than her competitor, Lee Stefanik. How would that change things, especially when we're talking about the big, big issues here? So for example, the Supreme Court. Let's say you have a progressive party and a center-left Democratic party. They're going to fight about climate change. They're going to fight about the Green New Deal. They're going to fight about the $3.5 trillion budget package. But they are going to vote in lockstep on Supreme Court nominees. And that is a type of vote which seems to be drawing or causing the Civil War level conflict we're, we're afraid of here. So how do you just reflect on all that? I think that if you had, uh, let's call them moderate Republicans or something like that, um, that that was like a non-Trump uh, alternative. I think they might vote along with Trump over and over again on a lot of things, but they might diverge from him on things like uh, vote counts or like constitutional protections of elections or, or things yes. like that. Um, I'm going to suggest that's a very crucial distinction <laughs> that, that if you had, uh, we'll had a critical mass of Republicans that, that were ready to do that, that I think we, we'd be in better shape. Uh, yeah, well. and, and that's a positive. Uh, that's one of the reasons why I think we need to build a more resilient system again. And uh, it, you, if you build a system like this and uh, it's now much more susceptible to authoritarianism and undemocratic impulses than most people would imagine. Uh, and we can change that. We can fix it. We don't have unlimited time, in my opinion, uh, but we should really work on it, <laughs> do it as quickly as possible. Um, but it's not about every vote. It's about certain principles that um, might be extraordinarily valuable to, to our country and our democracy. Andrew, one thing I want you to reflect on is policy. You know, when you ran, you were the policy candidate. You had the math hats. I used to really believe um, in policy that people would vote on policy. But as the elections went on and as I saw Trump win 10 million more votes, as I start to see, you know, stuff turn on questions of do you think the election was stolen or not, as opposed to did Trump do anything to actually better your life? I honestly got pretty uh, I was pretty blackpilled on the whole thing. And I guess my question to you is, does policy matter at all? Um, whenever it comes to these, because as you point to and as Marshall just alluded to, 62 percent say that they want a third party. Really, what that is, is they're holding a middle finger up and saying, I hate the system. And I've always ascribed Trump's success to nothing that he's ever actually done in office and just directionally being the voice that agrees with the majority of the public who say, I hate our institutions. And it was really upsetting to me to learn that that was enough for millions of people to cast their vote for president of the United States. Uh, how have you reflected on that from when you announced your, pol your run on policy and are almost in an age where... It's not the defining, you know, uh, it's not the defining issue of our time. 
Sagar, I go into this yeah. in my book in some detail, as you know, and I had a similar awakening or grappling as you. And in Ezra's book, Why We're Polarized, he talks about how the correlation between the way people vote and their policy desires are actually a very low. Yeah, right. <laughs> so they're like 0.25 where. Right. Um, so you're not voting on policy. Uh, what are you voting on? You're voting on tribalism and identity and anger and uh, the kind of um, energy that a candidate gives off and their attitude towards institutions. And so this is one of the things that I, I grapple with in my book um, and I've identified as the reason why I need to start the forward party and make it a success is that there is a band of people that did respond to me in my campaign, uh, the policy vision, the facts. And what happened was that we activated a certain group of people that like that kind of thing. Uh, maybe they like me. Maybe they like my, you know, like my particular energy. And when I started out, I thought I'd be received a certain way. Uh, I thought I'd be seen as very, very lefty because, you know, I was talking about giving everyone money. Um, but it turns out that I have a very different vibe, maybe because I've run businesses, maybe because I, I seem kind of uh, practical. Uh, and, and so it turns out there's like a lane um, for the practical person. Um, and when you talk about the things that are animating voters, uh, I, I now see myself as someone who can activate a, a tribe. And I was joking with some people that it's like, look, do I think that 51% of people love this language I speak of facts and rationality and fixing systems and the rest of it? It's like, probably not. Um, but do I think that 10% of Americans love it? And that 10% can do a ton of good in a country that's polarized the way ours is? Uh, and the answer to that is hell yeah. You know, it's mm -hmm. like I, if, if I get my band of rational, uh, solutions oriented, facts driven people together. And then we can come in and say, look, let's fix the system. So it'll actually work for everyone. And it's more resistant to bad things and, and you know, more pro compromise. And the incentives are more rational. Uh, I'm at heart, uh, an operator type. And if you arrive at a system and you see that the system is going to produce terrible results and oh, by the way, that's what we're getting. And, the, and in this case, those terrible results will actually eventually have us at each other's throats. I'm sure I'll uh, be like throwing things at you, know, <laughs> you and Marshall. And, no, I'm just kidding. But, uh, but um, you know, like if, if you arrive on the scene and that's the system, then the right thing to do is be like, all right, let's fix the system. And then if the systems run, in this case, by this duopoly, you'd be like, all right, how do we fix the system? It's run by this duopoly. Um, and the answer is something like the forward party, which is going to try and get into the guts of our system, fix the mechanics. Um, now, to do that, we're going to have to ignite a popular movement. Um, so let's get started. You know, it's funny. I don't actually believe anything I'm about to say, but I need to, I need to channel what a certain part of the Democratic part of our audience feels, which is... You know, Andrew, that was a really great articulation you gave of why minority rule in this country is a humongous problem. Rural states are overrepresented. There's this whole divide here, and we just can't get anything done or promote fundamental change. You know what would be faster than passing new elect election rules and structural changes in all 50 states? Let's just abolish the filibuster. Let's admit D.C. and Puerto Rico as states. Let's expand the Supreme Court to push back on this Republican minority that's holding back progress and change. Because once again, looking at the agenda of the forward party, which I'd like you to talk about in a sec, most of it does largely line up with what I think a center left audience is going to be comfortable with. So I just feel as if there's a portion of the audience you're speaking to that would just say, hey, the quicker way to guarantee we get the end of the logjam we're talking about is to just change those structural things in a much quicker way. And actually, all we are doing is doing mushy middle stuff that even if it does work, will take 48 years. And to your point earlier, it's not quite clear how long the democracy has. So how do you think and what, what do you say to that person who articulates that? Well, Marshall, I thought you were going to go a different direction there, which is uh, I thought you were going to say like, "Hey, why not abolish the electoral college?" Which is well, add that, uh, no, well, no, add, no, add that, add, yeah, add that too. All together. Thank you. Yeah, you can, I, you, I, I couldn't yeah, keep you can, track. You can, right. you can throw that one in there. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I'm a practical person again, and uh, to me, 
something like the Electoral College is just never going to happen. So, you know, why bring it up? Now, the other things that you talked about are more plausible and realistic. I happen to be for getting rid of the filibuster because there's absolutely nothing in the Constitution about a filibuster. And they just made that up <laughs> at a certain point. Now, everyone's just kind of going along with it. It's a very odd thing in my mind uh, for an institution uh, to uh, adopt. Um, but the, the way our politics is built right now is that neither side is going to be able to achieve a sustained governing majority by the numbers, by the math. Uh, and there are a number of structural reasons for that. Uh, you could say, to your point about urban, rural, and the rest of it, uh, that there, there's that divide, which I'd love to help reduce. Uh, but Republicans have a built-in electoral advantage because there are more of them in less populated states that are uh, overrepresented according to number of senators, electoral college, et cetera, et cetera. It's just the math, just the way it's set up. So uh, if you say, look, let, let's make these things happen by uh, jamming it through uh, as Democrats, um, you can look forward to the pendulum swinging back the other way, you know, X years later, and, and we're going to keep playing you lose, I lose forever. <laughs> so so that, that's not a, a sustained fix, um, though a lot of Democrats imagine it is because they just think that, you know, the demographics and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, the, the numbers don't bear that out because the population uh, difference in states that are already blue doesn't really make a difference uh, in terms of uh, Democrats' electoral strength. It was a guy named David Shore who said that Democrats would need to win 54 percent of votes in several elections in order to genuinely govern. And right. they didn't get that against Trump. Um, so, you know, to me, doing some kind of stopgap uh, changes that are going to get reversed two or four years later is the state we're in now. No, I think it's very important. I think David Shore is incredibly important, one of the most insightful figures that I think exists. Whenever we think and grapple with the last couple of years, Andrew, especially within your own, you know, moments within the race, to me, the most powerful moment of your entire campaign and when I saw you resonate the most is when you were on the stage and you were like, what are we doing here? We're all wearing makeup, like calling attention to the farce of the modern political system was incredibly powerful, both to me. I mean, you know, I've been waiting for somebody to say that for a long time, but I saw it kind of catch on within the normie electorate in a way that I hadn't seen something catch in quite a long time, and specifically amongst the people who kind of, you know, are within my audience, people who are younger and all of that. How do you harness that to political effect? Um, obviously, you know, it's, it's not like it worked out that particular way, but you're trying to do that this time. How are you trying to harness an inherently you know, skeptical audience of anything political, institutions, the moment you try and formalize it from, for lack of a better verb, it's a vibe. Like what you projected on that stage was the vibe of, hey, this is all fake. Like th this is all just a fakery. There, there's no reason that it has to be this way. And that was what the refreshing part of it was. How do we channel that into what exactly you're talking about here? How do you think about that? No, I, I tried to do that in the first section of my book, which I know you probably enjoyed for that. You know, I talked about the makeup and yeah. the grooming <laughs> and the filming of commercials <laughs> and a bunch of the other stagecraft. Uh, and it, it's really uh, farcical. Um, it's very dark. Um, I'm glad that you think that that caught on with people. Uh, and uh, what I want to say is that the entire... Uh, political struggle is largely theater at this point. Um, it's theater that unfortunately is meant to inflame us and turn us against each other, mainly so we can donate more money. <laughs> I mean, that, that's like yes. the main yeah, no thing. Uh, and, and so if we can extricate ourselves from this and say, let me not be inflamed for a moment. Let me uh, figure out what the real dynamics are and what the real show is and like what, what's happening to me and what they want to ha have happen to me. Then you wind up someplace like where I am now, which is OK, uh, we're being set up. Uh, if I try and help from within the system, um, we're going to be in a war that no one wins. We'll all lose. So let's try and fix the system. And I hope that there's enough energy around 
uh, this message so that people are excited. I, I love your description of a vibe too, Sagar. Like yeah. well, one of the things I have to do with the forward party is just try and project that infectious positive vibe. And if we can do that, then I think we'll do great because pe- people are so sick of shit. It's like you just look at and be like, oh, God, what's going on? What am I supposed to be upset about now? Like, yep. you know, I mean, there's like a lot of people. It's, it's so like, true. Hey, yeah. hey like, let, let's let's be sick of being sick of shit. And then let's try and fix the underlying thing. And then when someone comes like yelling and screaming about this and that, be like, you know what? Like, like, uh, let, let's try and fix the incentives that are literally driving you insane, <laughs> right. which and, and uh, you know, it's uh, so it's a it's a phenomenal project. I am super amped about it. Uh, it it's something that I think is going to uh, catch on because business as usual is just so uh, discouraging and disgusting. Can you reflect then, Andrew, on the hostility that you've received in elite circles? Because I think what and what Marshall had previously asked you about the Electoral College, Republicans are evil. We have to destroy the other side is, I would say, generally the prevailing mindset, either sympathetic or all out belief amongst the vast majority of the cultural elite and especially in circles that you yourself have run in and have have been outright hostile to what you're proposing here. How have you a reflected on that hostility from people who were very happy to have you on their program or whatever, whenever you were willing to fit into a certain lane, but b at the end of the day, we have to recognize that those people have power. You know, I, I've seen this in my own career. I have many more people who watch my show than many corporate media organizations, but I have no illusions that it's going to have the same level of oomph or power whenever it comes to influencing the political discussion. So first reflect on the hostility and be like, at the end of the day, those people do matter. They control a lot. How can it be overcome? They do control a lot. Um, But I I do think that people are starting to catch on. People are looking around and saying, you know what? Uh, I'm not sure that uh, these people are speaking to the heart of things or the truth of things. Again, it's one reason why I think what you and and Marshall and others are doing Mm -hmm. is so important. Um, The hostility toward me um, suggesting something different and new um, to me is just like a knee jerk institutional reaction. Um, And you would expect that Um, it has made me more pumped about what I'm doing, because uh, frankly, and and this is kind of funny, um, is that I think it's awesome that it's actually newsworthy that Andrew Yang is starting a third party. You know what I mean? It's like sure. uh, There aren't that many people that would provoke a negative reaction. (laughs) That's true. That's very true. (laughs) So I was like, sweet. Like, uh, you know, that 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 that's dynamite. Uh, and I think that our goal has to be to try and elevate enough independent voices so that they do have the same oomph, um, because you deserve it, uh, more in in many cases and people are hungry for it. Uh, subscribe to the realignment, everyone, but uh, it's, uh, but, but people (laughs) are, people are hungry for it. Uh, you know, and, and it is interesting the way it's playing out in our politics where again, the Democrats are kind of the last of the institutionalists. Um, and, and I consider myself like a fairly, you know, positive, upbeat, benign figure and whatnot. Uh, and so if, if someone uh, lashes out at me for some reason, it's like, wow, like what the hell's going on there? Right. <laughs> you know, it, 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 it's, uh, it, it's indicative of something. Hmm. I'd actually like you to speak to the institutional question because it's a very interesting biographical detail given your articulation of institutions right now, because something Sagar and I always talk about is a good way of understanding the history of the country since Watergate is just total declining trust and belief in legitimacy of basically every single institution, force, and figure in American life. This is the press. This is the media. It's corporations. It's your local Elks Club. Everyone is implicated. No one is largely blameless. That being said, you went to an elite boarding school you went to brown you, you you went to columbia so this isn't this isn't me trying to dunk it's just i'm interested in how you came about to the institutional skeptical position given your background 
Because it's not as if you are a person who's been pushed outside of a system your entire life and you're throwing bombs within it. You're kind of coming from the different directions. So could you just talk about that evolution or thought process given, once again, where you come from? Uh, I believe deeply in the promise of America as a child of immigrants. And so like I, I always believed that we were out to do right by people, by ourselves. Uh, and very lucky to, to have gotten a, a great education because my parents were all about it. Um, and I think for me, the big divergence was when I left my first job as a lawyer to start an ill-fated dot-com startup that crashed and burned. And then I worked at a series of other startups uh, here in New York and eventually had some success as the head of an education company. Um, and as a son of immigrants, uh, as someone who's an entrepreneur and startup guy, uh, as one of the only Asian kids in my school district, uh, which I was reminded of quite often, <laughs> that, uh, you know, I, I've always felt like a bit of an outsider. Um, and, uh, you know, that that's not something I, you know, I'm particularly mad at. I mean, it's just something that you kind of get the vibe, as you say. Uh, yep. And. Um, and at the same time, like I, I actually have, believe in our institutions, like I believe that they should be doing better. Um, I'm very disappointed when they take criticism poorly. <laughs> but like I I had this naivete that you're like, hey, you could probably like fix this or do this better that someone should be like, oh, like, you know, thank you for pointing that out. Thank you for pointing out that this duopoly makes no sense. We should work on that. Um, you know, instead of being like, oh, like you're going to screw it up somehow, you know, like I, I actually still have this sense of optimism about what our institutions could and should be. Um, now they're completely floundering and failing <laughs> like on, on, on several fronts. Um, but, you know, the, the arc of my family's life, super grateful to this country, uh, you know, that they came here to give my uh, my brother and me a uh, a real opportunity and it's worked. Uh, I want my kids to have the same opportunity and I'm going to do my, my best. Uh, and so I, I, I still have that belief um, that we can do better based upon my experiences. Um, but, you know, it's like if you go to Exeter, uh, I mean, if you look at the pictures of me there, I was like the goth kid. I mean, it's not like there was like, a, you know, um, I don't know. There weren't a ton of us, put it that way. <laughs> In either direction. Always a perpetual outsider. I... I'm really interested in the way you framed your skill set in the sense that you're a builder, you're an operator, because the part of me that is more optimistic around our ability to get around the current political challenges is I think that this set of challenges is going to require and invite a new style of leader into the political system. So it's thus going to be someone who could deliver nice quaffed talking points with their thin red tie on television as if it's a West Wing episode in the 1990s. It's going to be people who can build coalitions of people, forge consensus, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's not just patting on the back. That's, those are the general tasks of CEOs and people in that space. So I think that's an exciting note here. So I want to ask to the side of you that does have that background, how do you think the in the forward party would or should be run. Let me ask this specifically. Are you a political reform over everything else style perspective, or are there going to be all these other issues? Because what's so fascinating about diving into this 62% of independence group, and Sagar also is frankly like the most prominent person building this space could really articulate, this world that you're trying to build in is incredibly incoherent when you get into the deep, deep, deep deal. So there's the, 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 there's the broad agreement about institutional brokenness, corruption, et cetera, et cetera. But let's just say the last thing anyone really wants is to have Iron Dome funding um, thrown into the middle of all of that. Um, I could easily imagine a, let's say you had a big town hall, and anyone who's met with the DSA will tell you this too. If you have a big town hall meeting, you're talking about your agenda. Are you going to say, hey, we're going to put um, abortion policy to the side. We're going to put gun control to the side. We're going to put foreign policy and foreign aid to the side. We're just going to focus on that issue. Or are you going to try to form something coherent out of all these different disparate bits? I'm curious how you think about that as a leader. One of the fun things about this last week has been all of the independent political movements that have reached out to me to say, let's make common cause 
because we're all chasing the same thing. We're all chasing uh, reform of the system that will enable our point of view or different points of view to actually rise up and flourish uh, and not get pummeled into oblivion. <laughs> and these independent groups that have reached out to me uh, probably don't agree with me on everything, um, but they agree that we need to have open primaries and ranked choice voting so that they have a real chance, that we all have a real chance. Uh, I'm a deeply practical person. And so I think that everyone who's sick of the system should be getting behind these reforms. And I want the forward party to be the leader in making these reforms happen in real life. Uh, and to me, that should be the core issue. Nothing else should matter as much. Uh, and that's the, I think, clearing the principles of the forward party, which are, and you, you both have seen this, but it's uh, open primaries and ranked choice voting, fact-based governance, universal basic income, because it's me, um, modern and effective government, uh, which I think most people could get behind. And, and that should be something that pisses us all off is that we're, we allow our bureaucracies to be stuck in the Stone Age and be like, oh, I guess they just suck at things. <laughs> like, like that that should not be uh, something we accept. Uh, human-centered economy, which is just like we should be the, the measuring stick. And then the last one is grace and tolerance, which is you disagree with me. You're still an American. I love you. Uh, you know, we're not enemies. And with that as your founding principle, then if someone disagrees with you on abortion or gun control or uh, foreign relations, you'd be like, yeah, I guess we disagree on that. And it's like, you know what we can agree on? The fact that this system is broken and we need to <laughs> we, yeah. we, we need to change it. And I'm happy to say that a lot of independents are on the same page at this point. Like, what, That's one thing I love about independents is that a lot of them are practical. You know, that last part that you got to, I think is the most important one. And I've often said that one of the ways that you could actually just calm things down is to go to the extremists themselves and just say, hey, it is okay for somebody to disagree with you. I say this as somebody who comes and has seen both sides of the world. I grew up in deep red evangelical Texas, where it was also not so easy, you know, being somebody of South Asian descent. And now I live in the bluest city in the country, in Washington, D.C. And to see both the polarized sets of the movement. And to see also, I mean, to me, and uh, this is the second, I guess, most inspiring moment of your campaign, is I remember when you were talking about mortality rates. And you were like, hey guys, whether we, if we're dying, you know, more, that's like the basic metric. Like, are people dying at an earlier age? Something's going on. No, nobody, it seemed to me, had ever spoken to that in a not apolitical way that affects everyone. How... And what strategies, and again, I'm trying to get to the vibe because you caught on to this in your campaign. How is the most effective vibe for you in speaking to, you know, the, the cultural aggressors, both right and left? Because I think if we could just do that, just do that, we could get so much further and so much more. It's, it's the, one of the biggest problems we have in politics today. I agree. And one of my missions is to sit and talk to anyone who has an interest in having a, a principled conversation, regardless of whether they violently disagree with me on things that um, you know are important to them uh, or important to me. Uh, and that has to be the starting point, really. That's the vibe I want, is that mm -hmm. if someone's accepting of people with very different opinions, which right now is a real problem for Americans. Like if you disagree with them on something, then all of a sudden you're a bad person and then you're afraid to say you know things in various environments. Uh, that's not right. Most of us know that that should not be the case where you're living in some level of concern or anxiety or fear that someone's going to attack you for being a bad person because you hold a particular point of view. Uh, and I'd like the forward party to embody that energy that, look, we disagree, but we're all human beings. We're Americans. Uh, we have much more in common. Um, right now, universality is losing uh, and it makes me very, very sad. And I'd like to change that. Yeah. My last question here is going over the plank of the forward party, something will probably be noticed as missing is no reference to money and politics. And I'm curious how you think about the dynamic, because what's interesting is, and I should have noted this earlier, when you basically said 
open primaries will encourage folks not just to go to that 20% minority in the extreme level. I actually think it would kind of be the opposite because if primaries are actually more competitive, you're going to actually have candidates seek to get more and more and more money. And what actually would be effective in that strategy would be to say, hey, I actually am going to stay strong for pro-life, pro-choice, gun control, um, gun rights, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Give me money to do that. I think in a weird well, way- Well, that would that be could, rewarded. You're not wrong. <laughs> it, 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 really, it, really, it, really, it really would be rewarded. And I think it actually would probably be pretty successful um, because you would actually be in a weird way incentivized to lean even further into that base because it's not we're not Australia. This isn't mandatory voting. So it's not as if it's guaranteed that the independent voters will come out. So just what's to close out the interview- what are your, your broad thoughts of the role in money in politics in this whole discussion, given the dynamic I just set up? Yeah, there, there's a passage in my book about what I think the best solution is, which is just to give everyone democracy dollars that they can then donate to whomever they'd like. Uh, because right now, the political donor class is a very small proportion of Americans, and it does completely weed out 99 percent of good candidates because they can never raise the money. Um, and then if they do find themselves running, then they're going to appeal to uh, interest groups that can help fund their campaign. And that's just the market that we've created. So if I gave everyone 100 democracy bucks, then all of a sudden I get, you know, 10,000 people behind me. That's a million dollars. And then I'm off to the races uh, like that. That'd be much more balanced um, to your point about the composition of the electorate. Um, I mean, you would be including the folks in the minority party in that open primary. And so you'd inevitably have more voters and different points of view uh, because we're effectively disenfranchising 83 percent of Americans right now who aren't going to vote in that party primary. And then by the time it gets to the general, they're like, well, this is a done deal. <laughs> you know, and, and anyone listening to this, I mean, if you're a Republican in New York, where I am uh, or in other parts of the country, like you're an afterthought, uh, you know, and, and the same is true if you're a Democrat in uh, Texas, I don't know. I guess they're trying to change that. But, you know, <laughs> Wyoming. Was, yeah. Wyoming, sure. Just throw, throw out a red state. Um, and that doesn't seem like a fair system, uh, I think, to most of us. And so you look at it and be like, wait, why is it that my vote doesn't matter? It's like, oh, because I'm not like a registered member of the majority party. And then there are distortions that occur because you have one party rule in a lot of these places. Effectively, there are distortions that occur because you have a 92 percent reelection rate as long as you play ball. Um, so uh, I'm all for trying to balance out money in politics. Uh, I want to put people power and money into people's hands. And I say that because if I run around saying repeal Citizens United, get money out of politics. I mean, the fact is like that they'll, they'll have outsized influence anyway. You know what I mean? Like if, if I make dark money a little bit harder. It's like, I, I still think they're going to be all right. So the, the only way you can make it better is by actually balancing it out by putting more money into everyday Americans hands. Yeah. Uh, really well said, Andrew, just want to thank you so much for, for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Obviously book, all of that links will be down there in the description, but you know, I just say as somebody that I has followed you for a while and wants you to succeed that, you know, I'm, I'm with you all the way. So thank you. Appreciate it. Oh, thank you to both of you. Uh, really grateful, Sagar. And uh, it is so important what you guys are doing. Um, th this is a point of view that needs to be out there more prominently in the media universe. So anything I can do to help on that front, please let me know. What do you know, man? Thanks very thank much. Thank you so much. Bye, Marshall. Bye, Sagar. See you, man.